I'll wait till everyone's seated and quiet. Okay, great, thanks. So I'd like to pass the microphone to LMDA board chair, Brian Court, who's going to introduce and moderate this session. Brian. Thank you, Ken. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Brian Quirt. Um, he, him, his. Uh, as Ken said, I'm the uh, chair of the board of directors. And on behalf of all the board of directors, many of whom are here, uh, I want to welcome you all to LMDA 17. Uh, fantastic to revisit some old friends and meet you again a year later after Portland and so many new faces and it's a real thrill to meet all of you. Um, I am here uh, today and in fact a couple times during the conference to introduce sessions that have come out of the Bly Creative Capacity Grant Program and uh, it is a real honor to be part of that program and to have been part of creating it over the last three or four years. Uh, as many of you know, um, the Bly Creative Capacity Grant Program uh, was uh, established by and through an enormously generous donation to LMDA by Mark Bly, a former board chair, a member of very long standing, um, a conference organizer, uh, someone who has attended uh, many, not quite all of the conferences in our 30 plus year history, but almost all of them. Um, Mark uh, contributed a grant a donation of $100,000 over four years. Uh, we are just entering into the fourth year of the program uh, this fall. Um, in the first three years, we've had the uh, amazing good fortune to uh, offer grants to four uh, artists or groups in the first year, 2014, four in the second year, 2015, uh, and in 2016, we were able to offer three grants. Um, I want to take just a minute before I uh, introduce uh, a few words from Mark Bly, who couldn't be here with us. He has a series of uh, conflicting projects in New York right now, um, but has sent a message, which I'm going to read in a moment. Um, but first, I just wanted to thank the members of the founding committee, uh, particularly Cindy Sorrell, who is here, a former board chair, uh, the founding chair of the uh, Bly Creation um, Grant Committee, uh, and the chair for the first two years, and who is now taking on uh, uh, the wonderful and valuable project of beginning to document the impact of all of these uh, projects now that many of them from the first two years have reached completion or heading towards completion and the ripple effect of those is starting to be seen both uh, among the artists who uh, created them but also among the various communities that they were directed at. I also wanted to acknowledge Vicki Stroich, Jeff Prohl, Beth Blickers and Liz Engelman for their participation in the committee, uh, particularly at the founding level uh, and our uh, Adjudicators who joined the committee this year, um, playwright uh, Jacqueline Lawton, who many of you know, and uh, Canadian director, dramaturg Yvette Nolan, who participated in the process this year. Um, isn't that fantastic? Yeah, so yeah. nice. Yeah, I didn't know. That. That's great. <laughs> um, Mark Bly sends his regrets, and he asked me to, to read um, a few words um, uh, to the session, uh, and uh, this is what he sent. Um, Tanahasi Coates, in his letters to his son in Between the World and Me, writes, quote, you have, always, you have been cast into a race in which the wind is always at your face and the hounds are always at your heels, end of quote. A heightened wind of racism has begun to blow, write Mark, writes Mark, and the rabid hounds of conservatism in the aftermath of the 2016 U.S. election have been set loose. In the face of this, we were pleased to award LMDA Bly grants and fellowships in 2016 for projects that helped to unite black theaters, to champion the arts through dance dramaturgy, and to have an impact by funding environmental dramaturgy in the face of disastrous climate change and a national leadership that ignores inconvertible, incon inconvertible evidence. Pedro Scott's Black Theater Commons project unites black theaters and artists through an innovative online national platform. And Pedro is here and will be uh, articulating the details of that project um, on Saturday at 9 a.m., so I hope you join for that. Kate Bredesen's Portland in Motion Dance Dramaturgy seeks to introduce institutional dance dramaturgy into the Portland community through year-long conversations, workshops, collaborative, and solo projects. Kate couldn't be here um, and sends her regrets as well, and we hope that she'll report on that project um, next year at next year's conference. And finally, the reason we're here for this session, 
Amritha Ramanan and Alison Carey's environmentalism in action through contemporary and classical plays demonstrates how dramaturgs through a green turgy boot camp and then returning to their own respective theaters can have a significant impact on their community's future environment through their dramaturgical work. All of these projects, concludes Mark, reflect LMDA's growing desire to have an impact beyond traditional dramaturgical boundaries, and we look forward to receiving more projects of consequence from our members in the upcoming year. I'd also like to remind everyone that um, tomorrow, in one of the breakout groups at 315, the Spiderweb Show, which was a recipient last year of a Bly Grant, uh, will be doing a demonstration and articulation of their project, which is um, particularly fascinating on a technological level. Um, I believe the grants are having an impact of substance, and we look forward to another round this fall. Um, and I want to offer my congratulations to all of the recipients, and now pass it over to Amritha and Allison to speak to your project. Thank you. Hi. <laughs> How are you all? Yeah. Beautiful. Um, hey, everyone. Uh, as Brian said, my name is Amritha Ramanan, and my pronouns are she, her, hers. I'm Allison Carey, and my pronouns are she, her, hers. We are so excited and honored to be with you today um, to share uh, a little bit about um, the project that we are so humbled to have received a Bly Creative Capacity Grant for. And um, wanted to just acknowledge a few things. Um, uh, first of all, I have to say um, I wanted to echo um, Carmen Morgan and Lydia Garcia, as well as um, Ken, in the recognition of the land that we are on in Berkeley um, and the Native people who own and cultivate that land, the uh, Chechenyo. Huchian and the Muikma Olone tribes, because how can we begin a conversation like this, um, any conversation, but particularly one about the environment and land, without recognizing the people whose land we are on and the lasting impacts of colonialism and environmental racism, and how can we incorporate practices of decolonializing our, our field. And so that's something that we wanted to launch into that really intersects with um, the work that we are interested in engaging you all in. Uh, for the next couple days. So Allison and I wanted to share a little bit about um, our personal interest and um, uh, point of focus into this project and how that's manifested in some of the companies that we've connected with. And then really wanted to say that, you know, we are in no way, shape, or form experts in this. We are discovering it. There is a brain trust here. So wanted to be able to actually engage in a conversation and dialogue and really get thoughts and ideas. So the majority of our time we hope to dedicate to that. But I'm going to turn it over to Allison to talk a little bit about her personal story into Green Turgy. Um, yeah, I'll talk just a touch about my personal uh, path and then also talk about the Oregon Shakespeare Festival where I work um, and its particular uh, entry point into this work. So I uh, was co-founder of Cornerstone Theatre Company, uh, spent many much time around the the country and a lot of time in Los Angeles, and while even while in Los Angeles, spent a lot of time in the Central Valley of California. So the stories of environmental change in California are, and around the country, are obviously astounding. It's been going on for decades. It, it impacts the lives of people um, every day, and they know it. Um, and so my passion for this work actually started there. Obviously, it touches on my desire for my children to have a and everybody's children and all children in the world to have a, 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 a viable place to live in the decades to come. But I think the very personal stories that I learned from people who are facing this problem started me. And it got so profound that actually I decided to leave Cornerstone for um, a couple of different reasons, but I decided to go work for an environmental organization. And I was so psyched, and I knew it was exactly the right thing to do with my life. And then Bill Rausch, with whom I uh, started Cornerstone, called and said, so I'm moving to Oregon, um, and I'm thinking that we should have this big history play project, and would you like to run it? So I immediately forgot all about the environment um, <laughs> and decided to move to Oregon. Um, and now run a program called American Revolutions, which uh, commissions plays about moments of change in United States history. Um, and of course, a lot of the moments of change in United States history are environmentally based or certainly environmentally impactful. 
Um, now, interestingly, of course, when you decide to give up on the environment and you move to Oregon, you are moving back to the environment. Um, and Oregon is a very specific place. It's a place that has, I'm sure many of you know, the Pacific Northwest was sort of a hotbed of um, the environmental movement in the 70s with the um, tension between the logging community and people who didn't want the land, lo the land logged. Um, there was certainly, uh, in terms of the challenges of the environmental movement, it being so uh, the large money organizations uh, tending to be white, tending to be colonial, and the ways that that damaged the environmental movement and still actively does. Um, so I got to, but the Oregon's economy itself has made a transition, right, from being about logging um, to being about ecotourism. Um, which is a whole other, you know, manifestation of various colonial practices. Um, so, but when I got to Oregon, I thought, well, here I am in this very place where we love our trees and everybody must care about this very deeply. And I remember we were going to build a new building, which we eventually did. And I went to our executive director and I said, our then executive director, and said, so are we going to put green practices in our buildings? You know, LEED certification or any one of a number of wonderful things. And he said, no. And I was shocked that it actually had not been part of the conversation, and I, you know, I can't speak to his motivations or the motivations of our board, but I thought, wow, there's something really interesting going on, the sort of dis social disconnect and cultural disconnect and intellectual disconnect and moral disconnect between this institution and the pressures and the realities of where it's located in terms of being five hours from a city and in the middle of nature. Um, so at this moment, a whole bunch of other people at OSF started to feel the same things, had been there, people who had been there a lot longer than I had, and we started something called the Green Task Force. And it was a very large group and a very sort of uh, rambunctious, dedicated group um, that focused mostly on production practices, um, which is really, really great. But we never seemed to talk about the art um, in terms of the content of the art. And part of that, I think, was that there are a lot of people who didn't know what to do artistically in terms of how to talk about this. That it was perceived to be something by many people as primarily about nature, which is about trees and animals and not about people, which is strange, but that's sort of the way a lot of environmental art was created and especially perceived by the rest of the field. Um, and I think also one sort of the, the as the years went by, the the, this Green Task Force, this group of very dedicated people lost heart stopped coming to meetings, and uh, partially that was because at the Oregon Shakespeare Festival, I'm sure our production practices are no more or less green than a lot of people's, but our carbon footprint is huge because people come from all over. They come on their planes and they come in their cars, and at some point people were just like, it doesn't matter what we do. Like that central existential truth is not going to change, and so isn't it just hypocrisy to try to pretend to care? Which could be said of anything, right? So. Um, we, we kind of, the Green Task Force fell apart. Um, it's still going a little bit, but not that much. Um, and I think also there was an enormous amount of excitement. Um, and Carmen is here, Lydia is here, many, many people at the organization, that we started focusing very, very dramatically on our equity, diversity, and inclusion work, um, which is awesome. And obviously, we have miles, 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 and miles to go, and we know that. Um, but also, I think that we who in the Green Task Force failed to kind of make the case that environmentalism is, so is a social justice issue, and it's all part of the same thing, and we did not communicate that effectively, or we did not convince people, or we did not make the case, or there was so much going on, right, because, you know, people, human beings only have so much bandwidth. And when you're faced with something like climate change, you know, the, the tendency to despair is, can be very profound. I hung out with a guy named Tony Leiserwitz at the Yale Communication Project, the uh, Yale Climate Change Communication Project at this moment. And he said, well, so the art that nobody, like the art seems to be sometimes didactic and sometimes despairing, and that's not helping. And you have a problem with having a big carbon footprint and, and that makes you feel bad. What? what else can we do? And he started talking about the way Americans, especially white Americans, have been disassociated, have disassociated themselves from the natural environment. And he said, 
well, that's a problem for everybody. What can we do about that? So I started to think about instead of trying to do something that we weren't already doing because we had failed at that, what could we do that was taking advantage of what we were already doing? And it was really going after this question of just, you know, stories on stage, they all take place in an environment, right? They all have something happening beyond the theater walls. The questions that we ask in the plays, the answers will have impact on the environment, even if we don't think about it. And the, th the, the challenge is we don't think about it, right? Um, and so it was like, well, we do 11 shows a year. <laughs> How can we grab those shows and reestablish them as environmental messages? Because every story is environmental, right? Didn't happen. And then Amritha came. <laughs> and life became instantly better. <laughs> <laughs> and if you, for those of you who know Amritha, you're not surprised that I would say that. Um, and I, when Amritha actually applied for the job, she and I drove around and sort of, uh, I'll, I'll let her talk now, but she, <laughs> um, she took, she was able to see it and make it happen in a way that I was not able to, um, that I, and so now I'm going to let her talk. Um, there, thank you. Oh, talk. Thank you, Allison. Oh. Making it better. <laughs> As are you. I feel like <laughs> it goes, there's synergy there. Um, Thank you for all of that. And it's interesting because I know we've talked about some of that history, but even just hearing that again, and it, there, that has so much meaning and so much value. So I'm grateful to be present for that. Um, before I start talking about OSF, though, I did want to just lift up um, you know, a, a few um, you know, kind of personal um, points of ideology for me, as well as talk about um, two organizations that I've had the um, honor of being connected to that I feel really um, gave me a sense of this, uh, this relationship between art and environment. Um, so, you know, within my cultural construct, my family is from South India. My uh, father's family in particular um, uh, has farmland and rural Trivandrum. Um, I, I've always been very curious about um, how the environment is really uh, innate to one's practice culturally, one's practice artistically. And um, the amazing Leslie Ishii is here, and we were actually talking about just how um, there's so many cultural contexts where this is actually just, this is, you know, naturally present. And then I started working in theater and uh, realizing, as, you know, Allison did, that there were many variations of how the environment was really thought about in a framework of social justice and in um, a framework that was really part of our artistic culture. Uh, and so about um, three and a half, uh, now going on four years ago, uh, I had um, two two really kind of life-changing opportunities in this. Uh, the first was that I uh, studied um, with Adi Shakti, which is a theater company in um, Oroville, India. Um, and then from there, uh, joined a double-edged theater in Ashfield, Massachusetts as a company member. And uh, both of those organizations, <laughs> yes, for Double Edge, um, and both of those organizations um, uh, had models where they had theater centers and art centers that were on um, farmland. And uh, for Adi Shakti, uh, they had um, six acres of farmland that they cultivated, as well as three outdoor theater spaces in the natural environment. Um, and for Double Edge Theater, um, they had an artistic center that was on a former 105-acre dairy farm that they cultivated. And so with both of those companies, um, and I should say they are, you know, a few of many companies that are doing this kind of amazing work, um, and many organizations and communities that are doing this work, the um, relationship to environment and art was, um, there wasn't a hierarchy. They were just interrelated and interconnected. And to the point where all of us who were training or company members um, valued taking care of the environment in our job, so to speak, or in our positions there as much as we did creating our art. So there was that cultivation and creation in simultaneity. You know, at Double Edge, we would spend as much time weeding and planting as we would devising our art. And um, with um, 
Double Edge in particular, um, Double Edge is a physical theater ensemble that created uh, and creates a site-specific theater that travels um, to different locations with the audience. So every summer they would put on, and they continue to do, a production um, where you would literally go across the pastures, the hills, the streams, and watch the environment be animated by art, and that there would be a permacultural practice where we would literally grow um, our own vegetables, plant trees that supported these stages. So the cultivation of the stage was actually taking care of the environment. And um, that had so much meaning for me in terms of, you know, the constant recognition, the constant awareness of the land that we are on. Um, Double Edge also um, recognized the tribal nations of the land and really, um, you know, would would work with um, with in partnerships with Native communities. That's something that's relatively recent for them, but is continuing to develop. Uh, so all of this to say, when I interviewed for OSF, um, you know, during my interview, I, I forget exactly what I said, but it was something outright to the point where I'm like, this is, you know, this type of ethos needs to continue in whatever I do. And then Allison and Carrie and I continue to have, you know, five hour conversations weekly. And um, but we knew do no weeding at OSF. Where we sadly don't yeah, no weeding at OSF, but that could change. Okay. Um, and uh, so uh, so then you know we um, we started to really think of um, with Green Turgy as Allison lifted up um, the the notion that um, a conversation around the environment and the many facets of that should not be segregated to plays that are labeled environmental plays. How can we look at every piece of work that we create artistically and really take on an awareness of those points of conversation? And how can we as dramaturgs really be change agents in moving art to action and allowing this to be part of the work that is really um, within the sphere of what we do? Um, so that's manifested in a couple ways. And I will openly say, you know, it's still very much an exploration. We're still figuring it out. Um, but, you know, but this year, um, we have, you know, an amazing cohort of dramaturgs at OSF, um, Martin Key Green Rogers, Leslie Ishii, <laughs> Lydia Garcia, so many, um, who we started to engage in these conversations and say, what's interesting for you? Um, and, you know, Martine, I'm going to lift this up. Martine has been doing some amazing curriculum work around this with her students. Um, you know, Leslie is part of the, um, you know, the, Ar you know, Arctic um, Circle Committee that's been working with indigenous peoples around this. I mean, it's just, it's amazing the amount of work. Um, Annalisa Diaz, who's coming later today, has an amazing initiative on like decolonizing practices. So, um, so really, it was very much how do we actually share ideas and resources to make this, you know, uh, um, in some ways, a dramaturgical collective where we can have allyship and support one another. And then we also started to experiment with um, existing uh, programs and projects at OSF. So, uh, for every play, we have an educational study guide, and we uh, asked our education team would you be willing to incorporate questions such as, you know, what is the broader environment of our works, whether metaphorical or literal? Um, you know, what are the parallels between the natural world and the world of the plays? How do the characters intersect with the natural world? Um, you know, uh, and really actually have those questions be part of the dialogue with our communities, with our students, with our audiences. So that's a little bit of that. Is that, that is. Thank else? you. Hey, can I ask a question? Do we have five more minutes or do we have more than okay. we have five? Okay. So we need to cut right to the chase. We do need to cut to the chase. Um, and the chase should be... <laughs> 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 this one, right? <laughs> yeah. So, yes. Um, one yes, we're going to... So we were going to do exercises, but we're only going to do one, which is... So we have this boot camp happening tomorrow where, as Amrita said, we... This is all about us creating it together, right? That's... Everything has to be collective, mm -hmm. right? Or we're doomed. So this is true of this sure. as true as everything else. Yep. Um, you may be participating in the boot camp. If so, awesome. You may not be able to. If so, awesome. If you want to do it now, if you change your mind and want to do it now, awesome. We'll also be talking about on Saturday what we learned, what we're continuing to explore. But we would like everybody in this room to participate even a little bit. And Amrita will tell you how. Sure. Okay. So um, 
to my left over there, we have a green turgy simmering pot. Um, thank you, Leslie Ishii, for that naming. And uh, what we wanted to do is just engage anyone who's willing in um, an opportunity to be able to write down on a post-it that'll be distributed by our amazing volunteers, um, a suggestion, an idea, or um, something that you feel is critical that we have to explore during Friday's boot camp. And this can mean if you are attending, you can still contribute because we're going to go over them together. If you're not attending, please contribute and we're going to incorporate that into the boot camp. Um, and for those of you on HowlRound, if you want to contribute, um, just feel free to tweet in, you know, your idea with the hashtag LMDA2017 and our friends at HowlRound will collate that. So really, we need uh, collective thinking around this. We want to hear what is meaningful to you, either in what we said or what we didn't say that we really need to lift up. So um, we invite, just please share your thoughts, ideas, questions, put them on there, and then that'll be part of, you know, our ongoing work. And including in that, if you have a beautiful piece of art in your mind that you think is important and needs to be lifted up to the field, whether it's a new play or a classic play or anything at all, share that too, right? Because we're going to crea be creating not only tools but resources for people who want to focus on this kind of art. And it could be uh, something that has nothing to do overtly with nature or it could be something that does. So just share whatever is in your heart with us and we will hold it and thank you so much. Ju thank just you. before you wrap up, um, the, the boot camp here obviously is a huge part of this project, but it will continue through the season at OSF. Is that... Oh, yes. Yeah, just mm -hmm. in terms of the longer term plan. We hope it'll continue for the rest of our lives. <laughs> yes, exactly. exactly. Well but said. only if you help us. Yeah. <laughs> and, and like all the Bly, Bly Creative Capacity Grants, um, we'll look for ways to disseminate mm -hmm. the information, the lessons, the content uh, at future conferences, but also hopefully and ideally between now and then as well as, as the progress continues over the course of the coming months. Mm -hmm. Thank yeah. you. Yes, yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Great. So I see post-its are being distributed. We've got some pens and pencils. And yeah, you know, just throughout the weekend also, if you just want to find us in the halls or, you know, want to connect and say, hey, this has meaning to me. I want to talk about it. Or you should really know about, you know, um, this individual because we will be, as part of this project, um, creating uh, an online virtual um, resource, uh, you know, kit that's really crowdsourced that has different suggestions and links for folks to connect with, um, please let us know. And thank you so much. Thank you all. You look yeah. awesome, by the way. Yeah, Everybody sitting totally. in your chairs. Yeah, it's a beautiful group. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you both. Have a great Green Turgy Boot Camp tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you, um, thank you everyone. I'm going to pass you back to Kent. Great. So we're going to shift gears here and invite up... Um, our VP of Regional Activity, Joanna Falk, and um, 